Uh, my name is Himanshu Mehra. Uh, I'm a product manager in uh, Cisco in the enterprise group. Um, I was, uh, I, I've been doing catalyst switching for a while and I've kind of transitioned to this role looking at how catalyst switching and how do we innovate with catalyst switching and solve problems with IoT in the enterprise. I think the focus of this session is going to be defining what, uh, I think all of you have heard of IoT. Uh, the, the focus of this session will be defining what enterprise IoT really means and how IoT applies to the enterprise and what Cisco is doing uh, in this space a little bit uh, and how it kind of applies to some DevNet stuff, and some, some of the cool demo, demos that we have in DevNet and other booths here. Uh, so guide you a little bit there. So we've seen that you know, businesses are really evolving. Uh, there are a lot of devices and services that exist in the network today um, that are not really connected to the IP network. I mean, just take the example of this uh, stadium here, or, or this pavilion here. I mean, we have lights, we have sensors, occupancy sensors, things like that, IP cameras, uh, you know, video cameras, et cetera, that are, that are managed by some kind of a network, but not necessarily the IP network. But we've seen this major trend of low voltage, kind of convergence to IP, and I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about that. We've seen IoT-enabled applications that are getting prevalent in this space. So if you, and I'm just getting deeper into that, I mean, we have hundreds of networks, like you know, building management systems, lighting controls, uh, CCTV networks, other access control networks that are all managed by some kind of a vertical solution, by control system companies, et cetera, but they're not converged to IP yet. They're running on potentially RS-485, BACnet, UART-based protocols, uh, which are not on Ethernet or even IP over wi wi wireless, et cetera. And the opportunity on, of bringing these devices onto the, onto the network is really immense. And the benefits are also there for, of course, Cisco, as well as all our customers on you know, the, the, the kind of services that you can enable, how you can manage them over IP, how you can kind of talk to potentially uh, your fire alarm sitting in the building and ask it to turn on or send you an alert on your mobile phone that there is something happening. So the, the benefits are definitely immense. And uh, today at Cisco, we are looking at uh, what this space really means for our customers and for us, and how we can enable this ecosystem uh, through you know, developer enablement as well as uh, you know, product enablement, and what we can do, what we need to do on our existing products, or do we need to build new products really to enable this. So you, as these networks are disparate, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history on what's happened over, over time. I mean, you might remember, you know, 10 years ago, PBX was a completely separate network, and then eventually it kind of converged into IP. Uh, we saw things like IP cameras with coax, et cetera, even, you know, some building management services with BACnet over time have converged onto IP. Now we have, like, for instance, BACnet over IP running, and uh, that gives us capabilities to manage, uh, you know, even some building management services over IP, and so these trends are happening. The latest frontier, I, I call it, the latest frontier in this trend is really high voltage, high voltage AC converting into IP. And you know, how is this even possible? Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of power over Ethernet. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some innovations on power over Ethernet that enable these use cases. So high voltage AC has a number of problems. It is unsafe. All these lights, especially these high bay lights, require 270 volts, and it's a safety hazard to mount them, there's restrictions, it's costly to get the cabling up and running, etc. So, and then we look at power over Ethernet, and then we say, you know, can PoE potentially power these lights? And is that an IoT use case? So that's the kind of questions that we are asking ourselves, and I'm going to give you a little bit more preview on what that really means. So, you know, what is really driving it? I mean, sure, you can connect PoE to lights, but why would anyone do that? And why couldn't we do that, like, say, 10 years ago? So there's a number of things on the technology space that are changing which drive that. So the number one thing is, you know, from the lighting perspective, the prices of LED is really dropping. So the value proposition of LED lighting has just completely changed this dynamic. Most of the companies back in the day uh, used to use fluorescent light, and now you potentially heard of uh, various lighting companies talking about LEDs, which have longer lives. So for just to give you an example, uh, fluorescence used to last three to five years, and uh, all enterprises would you know, replace the fluorescent bulbs every five years, roughly. LEDs can potentially last up to 15 years. So the value proposition to anybody, the building services and 
uh, potentially even IT, et cetera, and the CFO is immense, that you deploy a light, it lasts for 15 years. So even though LED costs a little bit more, the value proposition in just terms of the total cost of ownership for a company is much lower. But that said, the prices of LEDs are dropping. The efficiency of LEDs is improving. So the lumens per watt of an LED continues to improve. And there's a lot of innovation going on in that area with large semiconductor companies looking at how do we continue to ride that uh, efficiency curve for the LED market. And there are new experiences possible on the LED, with the LED. Uh, you know, LEDs can be dimmed automatically, they can be color tunable. Um, in case, if, if you're in like a retail store or something, and uh, you know, you have LEDs there, you can say that today I have red stuff on display and suddenly change the color of that LED from you know, your standard white light to red to enhance that value of that red. Uh, tomorrow you have some blue shirt on display and you can change that same LED to be blue. So all this can be done without any uh, change in physical thing and without any infrastructure installation or anything like that. It's all done over software, IP enabled kind of stuff. So the LED brings additional benefits which are pretty compelling for people to look at it. So, any, so most companies I talk to are, if they're looking at new lighting, most new construction, et cetera, they're not even looking at fluorescent anymore. So that battle is, and I speak with lighting companies uh, a lot, and I think 50% uh, of their shipments are, I mean, close to 50% of the shipments are already LED globally now. So you know, that frontier I think we've crossed is just a question of when people refresh and convincing people, right? Now, I talked about the experiences. So, so LEDs is happening. You can, of course, still power the LEDs over your standard AC. But you can also power them over PoE and to, talk, to, to, bring, to bring some other additional experiences possible to the, to the customer. And we've made tremendous improvements in PoE. So when we introduced PoE over switches, it was more like, can we potentially power an IP phone which takes seven watts of power? And the PoE standard, the power over Ethernet standard, has evolved since. Uh, with the 802.3 AF standard, we could do 15 watts over the standard Cat5 cabling. Uh, then we went to 30 watts, and with 30 watts, we could, you know, power some of the access points that required more power. We could power some IP cameras that were not possible with the 15 watts. But a few years ago, Cisco introduced uh, something called the Cisco UPoE, the Universal Power Over Ethernet that instead of using the two cables in a standard Cat5, use the four cables in the standard Cat5 and could allow an endpoint to draw up to 60 watts of power. Now, 60 watts is a lot of power. Uh, when we introduced this technology, the use, we did not have lights in mind. We did not even think of lights. Uh, we like, okay, you know, we can do this from a technical perspective and there potentially are use cases. And then we had some success with, you know, healthcare, where people were powering some healthcare devices and then you know, in the financials, some people were powering some IP cameras and things like that. Some telepresence systems even could be powered and things like that. But then like, you know, a couple of years ago, we looked at lights and we're like, okay, you know, this is really possible because the LED efficiency is improving. So with the UPoE can potentially now power a light. And uh, the, the use cases and the benefits can be really immense to customers and building services, et cetera. So that's what's happening with UPoE. Other than just the power aspect, it's a safer technology. It uses structured cabling. It's much, much cheaper to deploy UPoE cabling uh, in, the, in any building versus you know, high voltage AC cabling. So the benefits are definitely there a lot. UPoE is getting close to uh, standardization in IEEE. So there's a standard called IEEE.3BT, where we are looking at uh, standardizing UPoE and thinking of what else is needed on the UPoE side to make it more kind of uh, more robust, if you will, for building services, etc. So all that work is happening, and Cisco is playing a big active part in leading those standards. So how does this kind of come together? I mean, on, the, on this side here, you see an AC voltage network and a lighting control module. So you see really two networks here. One is for power, and one is for lighting control. And uh, every company that's deploying lights and wants to do smart lighting, or even wants to manage lights more than just a light switch, is having to deploy this. And these sit on, as I talked about it, you know, some older protocols like you know, DALI, Dynet, some other lighting protocols out there. But on the right side, you have this PoE Ethernet enabled lighting network. So one cable drop on each potential light, or even maybe a collection of lights, depending on how, you, how, much, lights, how much power the lights require, for both power and control. 
So just in that, like you reduce from two to one, and if you start bringing in other services, you reduce more cabling infrastructure. So it's all about like, cabling costs a lot of money. I mean, I've spoken with uh, customers where one cable drop in a large warehouse or you know a convention hall like this can potentially cost five hundred to thousand dollars for each cable drop. Now, if you can reduce that cable footprint, so first you reduce the footprint and then you reduce you know the cost that that you're incurring. So there's you know definitely benefits there, and uh, we are we are looking at this connected lighting to really unlock the potential of IoT. So you know, just kind of give you a preview on the use cases that might be possible here. So the number one use case is, you know, of course, power efficiency. Using some of these lights, we can do things like daylight harvesting. So for instance, you know, those lights over there, because of so much daylight coming in, don't really need to be on. So if you have a conference room in your building, which has windows, and when the windows are open, the lights can potentially just automatically dim down. Um, I'm up in San Jose, and uh, we recently deployed uh, some of these lights in a few of our conference rooms as a you know, pilot. And uh, the first day we were there, I mean, you know, those lights, you know, you, we were always kind of confused with how the lights work in the, in the old times. You switch it on, sometimes the lights are dark, sometimes they're dim, and then you open the windows and you can't see the projector, and it was like not a very pleasant experience. So now we have these LED lights deployed, and we walk into the conference room and we open the blinds, and the lights, like within like 30 seconds, we notice that they're dimmed down, and the experience was, I mean, it was just different. Like, we just didn't have to play with the switches. We didn't have to say, oh, let's switch on that light and not this light because the windows are on or something like that. So it just kind of worked uh, much easier that way. One of the other, other important use cases to point out is, you know, personalized workspaces. So, you know, somebody likes dim lights and somebody likes <laughs> um, uh, bright lights. So we have a demo in the world of solutions, and I'm going to tell you where the demo is, where we are actually demoing, you know, from your personal mobile phone, you can turn on brightness. Now, if the lights are an IP, those kinds of things are possible. You walk in and, you know, your personalized workspace realizes that uh, you are so-and-so, and automatically, based on that, the settings happen because you are such and such person. And, uh, you know, we've partnered with a few companies, and we're demoing some of those things in the world of solutions out there. Uh, another important use case which, uh, which, has evo which, uh, which has become very prevalent is you know, this whole thing about human-centric lighting and uh, the circadian rhythm of human beings on what kind of lights they light. Like, so the research shows that you know, students in, in colleges, schools concentrate better with brighter lights. Uh, patients in hospitals prefer certain kinds of lights when there's no doctors or nurses looking at them. So, these color tunable lights, which are IP enabled potentially, can potentially follow the circadian rhythm of what people want and can be programmed that way. So there's a lot of research that states that people are more productive and students are more productive and patients feel better when the, the light and the environment suits them better. Uh, so that's you know, definitely another thing that we're looking at. And there's other generic, generic lighting applications. I think um, one pet peeve of my, like, my biggest concern sometimes is that you know we, we, we like all of us potentially work in companies where we have to reserve conference rooms, um, and uh, a lot of times we don't know whether the conference room is booked or not. Outlook shows something, and you go there and nobody's there, or Outlook doesn't show something, and you go there and you know, there are ten people sitting in that conference room. Now, a light can potentially have a sensor to determine if somebody's there or not in real time. So, an application could potentially tie in based on just real time availability of conference rooms. And uh, I know of some companies that have done this without lights, so this is something that definitely IT, uh, IT teams around, around you know, the country and global are looking at applications like this. But you know, light, uh, if you look at the real estate on the ceiling, what you see is lights and some other things. So for data gathering and for data collection, uh, lights are a very natural place and kind of do such kinds of analytics. So just other than real-time um, real conference room availability, just things like, you know, who's using what kind of space? Is the third floor on my building used a lot, or is it kind of just creating heat, those kinds of heat maps on, and then doing space utilization around that? Uh, and I talked about the lighting in retail stores, and that can be tuned based on color, et cetera, and, uh, you know, what can be done. So, you know, user experience is better. We've done some research around that. There's total cost of use, energy use, et cetera, is better. And we've you know, worked with some customers and partners, et cetera, to determine this. And 
connected lighting with PoE, et cetera, does enable business analytics in terms of the space utilization, and et cetera, in the buildings. So the benefits are really you know, threefold there, as I, as I look at it. Um, sorry. So I talked a little bit about this, but since the real estate on the ceiling is mostly lights, these lights are now connected to the IP. So if you're doing IoT and collecting data gathering, occupancy, and these kinds of things in your building, where would you naturally put a sensor? Would you really want to put a sensor somewhere else and then manage it completely separately, or would you rather hook it onto the light? And, uh, and I'm not talking about something really futuristic here. If you look at LED offerings from any major lighting company, they have a notch for sensors on the light now, and they are potentially coming out with, can I put an occupancy sensor here? Can I put a heat sensor here? Can I put an ambient light sensor here to determine what's going on in the building? So this is all happening, and uh, downstairs in World of Solutions, if you go in the IOE pavilion, there's a couple of demos which kind of focus on healthcare and education, which exactly do this. And we are kind of simulating daylight harvesting using a torchlight over there and saying, okay, you know, we're using this torchlight, it's bright, and you automatically see the light dim down. And uh, so, so this is all real, and really it's really enabled uh, using PoE and uh, Ethernet here. And you know, the, this, is a, this is a heat map. So you see that conference room over there with red is used a lot. So a space planner can really determine, you know, this floor really needs another conference room. And that corner of the building, which is green, is not really used. So can I put a conference room over here and kind of spread the traffic and make it easier for people? So this kind of intelligence was just not, it's not just not there today. It's just kind of hearsay that, you know, you don't have conference room employees complaining and things like that. Um, so coming to controls, you know, what does, this, what does this really require? We've looked at wireless technologies. Um, wireless is great for places, I mean, lights are not going to move around, they're going to be in one place. So though, wire, though wireless is great, I think it has a couple of, it can potentially have a few problems. One is an in just installation, cost of installation, etc. cetera. Uh, not so much from buying the equipment, but just provisioning the network with wireless can be challenging. But then it's still, no cabling is required, so if you're just redoing your existing building, you potentially wouldn't want to redo all the cabling from AC to PoE. But uh, when you start looking at new construction, when you start looking at deep retrofits in building where you're just kind of redoing everything, looking at PoE and Ethernet, Ethernet definitely has a lot of value. Uh, so the industry as a whole is looking at you know, wireless as well as wired and seeing you know, what, is, what, what is the more benefit here. Of course, on the control side, uh, we have you know, the conventional controls with just light switches, et cetera. And now you know, we are looking at intelligent controls just to set policies, you know, software-defined lighting policy. Uh, can you just kind of set something like that? And so there's, there's a revolution in controls that is also definitely very necessary as you kind of start looking at uh, this space. From a Cisco perspective, just have 10 minutes more and a bunch of slides, so I'm going to just accelerate, but you know, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, on, on the control side, you know, how, how Cisco is looking at this? Uh, there are two kind of parts to it. There's this whole uh, endpoint aspect to it where and where, where IoT protocols come into play. We have the, the, the number of different IoT protocols that are very optimized for 8-bit MCUs, et cetera. So we want to add value to the network. I mean, we're a networking company, so we, we're not looking at what do we do on the endpoint or what are we looking, do, looking at apps, but we want to add enough value to the endpoint to make it easy for endpoints using IoT protocols to get onto our network, to be able to easily provision it, provide secure access to these endpoints, and then on the other extreme, we want to provide open APIs such that anyone can write a management application potentially to manage this. I mean, of course, Cisco will have partners on each side that we'll work with, but uh, we are looking at this from an, archi from an architecturally, we, this is how we're looking at it. Uh, open uh, IoT protocols on the endpoint side to enable them to onboard, and then open APIs on the management side so that it could be, you know, you want to manage your uh, building systems over VM, you can do that. You want to manage that over cloud, you can do that, but the APIs should be open. So this is how, I mean, this is another picture on how this would come together, really. Um, the switching kind of network infrastructure, which would have enhancements on protocol side, you know, more PoE robustness, as well as uh, security capabilities. Um, data breaches should not happen just because somebody hacks on to your light. So light should not be talking to your financial database sitting. Light should potentially be only talking to either no one or the lighting control module but nobody else, so that all can be in, uh, in, uh, instituted using, with, using the network infrastructure. And we're looking at how do we innovate in that space using the network infrastructure. And then how do you enable, so 
this is really a vision of di the digital ceiling. You know, we have access points and surveillance cameras and ceilings already. Now, how do you get more devices out of the ceiling that can make your lives easier in IT and building services, and then you know add value to the people, the people who actually live and work in these buildings? Um, we have a case study here. So again, this is not all fluff. This is not just very futuristic. We've worked with customers who've deployed certain lights. Very early customers right now. A few customers where we've the benefits I talked about, SIPCO, it's a power control company, and they realized that. All right, I'll change gears a little bit. Uh, we talked about connected lighting. We talked about the benefits of connected lighting. Uh, we talked about some stuff that we're doing. And uh, in my last slide, I'm going to show you like five or six demos that we have in this area on connected lighting, where you can go and talk to um, some of the experts, even from some of our partner companies. But I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about um, a parallel aspect which we are doing on the enterprise IoT side. So we are, uh, we are working on a device called the Talum that essentially uh, takes in USB and converts it into Ethernet PoE. So there's a whole lot of USB sensors out there, and they connect to the building using USB. Now, if you want to deploy these sensors, you potentially need USB cables from things like Raspberry Pis, and in some cases, even PCs and laptops, et cetera, to do simple things. So this is a prototype, prototype device that we have available on, on, on DevNet, uh, which, can, which takes a USB device and can take in data from the USB device and really put it into any IP-enabled network. So the, the USB device looks pretty simple. It's PoE on Ethernet on one side. It gets the, uh, ether, the, the sensor can get potentially powered. And we have worked with a lot of these sensors to bring them onto the IP network. The number of benefits to Talem. The Talem is a simple FPGA. So it's really, it provide, other than just providing power over Ethernet, it's plug and play. You don't have to write code on the tail end to configure your sensor. You plug in the sensor, and the data automatically starts kind of flowing through based on some intelligence that we added to you know, our switching side. It's a secure platform because it's, again, an FPGA. You can't really write code on it, so how would you hack it? There's no microcontroller running on it. Uh, it can be managed remotely. The sensors, et cetera, can be managed remotely. And it you know, reduces your TCO, a total cost of ownership, from just managing your network point of view. So it's a great device that way. I mean, getting a little bit into the technical aspects of it, you know, so on the left side is, uh, on the right side is, you know, just the Talem, the USB device connected to the app. So there's a USB IP server that, that we've added onto the Catalyst switch that can connect to this Talem device that's connected to USB. And on the other side, you, uh, we've added like Python libraries and applications that can collect this data. So if you have a light sensor, the light sensor keeps spitting out data, which can be then looked at in your management app. And you can have policies such that, uh, or let's take the example of a heat sensor, that if the heat goes above a certain threshold, notify me, or start the fire alarm, because you know, the heat would only go beyond a certain threshold if there's fire in the building. And uh, you know, we have some demos to kind of show this as well. Uh, I'll talk about some of the other use cases that have uh, you know, become prevalent with Talem. Um, take the example of a coffee barista, uh, and they want to enable you know, remote ordering of drinks. If somebody on their mobile app, app orders a cappuccino, the coffee barista should be able to create the cappuccino, put it on a temperature-controlled area. Now, the person walks in five minutes from now, they potentially get a hot drink, but if the person doesn't walk in for 20 minutes, the drink would be cold. So the, the barista needs to be notified again that this drink has become uh, cold and they should remake that drink potentially. Now this barista, have you partnered with the company to kind of look at it, and they were looking at heat sensors connected to laptops. And now, and that would be a very expensive solution if you have to have sensors connected to the laptop, but if you have sensors connected to this small, small device, you could get the same level of intelligence on these sensors using that. Another example is of a stadium. I typically you know, use the SAP Pavilion as an example, but take the example of Petco Stadium where we have the Aerosmith concert. Now, typically, there are games happening in that stadium, and uh, you know, stadiums and other people are looking at eye beacons. I'm assuming you know of the Bluetooth LE technology using, you know, that enables eye beacons. And eye beacons uh, let, let advertisers advertise and let people come in and send notifications. Now, eye beacons are programmed using UUIDs, et cetera. And it, like in a venue like a stadium, like Petco Stadium typically has you know, uh, the ga games being hosted. So they have different kinds of advertisements. But tomorrow, there's an Aerosmith concert, Cisco Live Aerosmith concert, by the way. I hope you all are, all are going there. And you know, we might want to have different kinds of notifications to users. Now, the stadium cannot offer these capabilities if they have to go in and take out all the eye beacons, manually program them, and put them back. 
Now, if these eye beacons are connected to something like a Talum over Ethernet, you can remotely just program the UUIDs of these eye beacons and uh, have a different kind of experience for the guests coming in for the Aerosmith concert tomorrow. Uh, better yet, you don't have you don't have these these eye beacons are not living on battery anymore. They are potentially powered over POU, so you install them once and you forget about them. So there are a number of benefits that we're looking at just using PoE. Uh, Talem is available on DevNet. You can find more detail on the Talem device on DevNet. Uh, there's a section on Enterprise IoT, so definitely encourage you to visit that page. If you haven't signed up for DevNet, please sign up for DevNet, and you know, you'll be able to get all these details for free. Uh, we, can, uh, we have a program going on where you can potentially, depending on your application, ship out some Talem devices to you so you can kind of build your own applications using this. Keep in mind, Talem is still a prototype, uh, or, and potentially will always be a prototype, but we're looking at using the data that we've created, uh, our experiences that we're creating with Talem and looking at what our next gen Talem would look like. There's a number of, uh, so we talked about kind of two things, connected lighting, and the benefits with connected lighting as well as Talem. There's a number of demos. Uh, definitely encourage you to visit, uh, you know, in the world of solutions downstairs, we have you know, some of the lighting demos. Just over there, we have a Talem demo uh, describing some of the building services that I talked about um, and some of the other things. So you know, definitely use this as reference and visit our booths where we are showing, showcasing a bunch of these technologies. So I thank you for your time. Uh, definitely happy to answer any questions. So, so the question is, the cost of the PoE port uh, a concern? And the answer is absolutely it is, uh, but I, I think we've done enough uh, research to see, see that like, the, the, the cost of the cabling definitely compensates because the cost of the high voltage cabling on the lights is really very high, but cost of the ethernet cabling is much lower and then it's a converged infrastructure. So the cost of the port is of concern and we're looking at how to kind of bring that down and do we really need a Catalyst 4500E for this light because it really doesn't need all the layer 3 OSP or BGP kind of features that live on the switch. So we're looking at how to innovate on that end. But in the meantime, even with the higher cost of port, I think it's not much of a difference between uh, just because of the cost of cabling. Uh, I've been told that my time is up, but I'll be here if you have any more questions. Thank you.